Off the coast of the Mariana Islands lies a volcanic rock known as Anatahan. It's here in 1951, nearly six years after Japanese surrender in World War II, that 19 of a original 31 survivors would surrender in the common told tales of Japanese holdouts after World War II. But for the survivors of Anatahan, their tale on the island of survival, love, murder and war were a mix that's anything but common. Japan's history with the island of Anatahan first dates back to the First World War, when Japanese forces on the side of the Allies occupied the islands, then under the Pacific colonies of Germany. After the First World War, Japan obtained these Mariana Islands through mandates. Soon the Japanese would establish state-owned enterprises on these far-flung territories to engage in fisheries and exploit natural resources from these islands and their new territories. Under this new Japanese foreign policy, the island of Anatahan would too come into frame as Japanese nationals were soon sent as advisors to the island to set up and run the plantations left over by the Germans as well as supervising the native laborers residing on the island. The first Japanese advisor selected to be sent to Anatahan was Kikuchiro Higa, but soon he would be joined on the island by his fellow Japanese deputy overseer, Sohoichi Higa, and his wife, Kazuko Higa. And yes, despite them having the same last names, the men were not family. With the young couple coming to Anatahan from the nearby island of Saipan. For a short few years, everything seemed well on the island. The three Japanese now all together ran the plantation with the natives, as the war was still raging on in the Pacific, and at that time felt a world away from the peaceful nature and isolation of Anatahan. However, peace could only last so long especially in that region of the Pacific, as Japan began to lose more territory as the war progressed into 1944. The war now appeared to be on the island's doorstep. With the fear of war in the air, Soichi Higa, the island's deputy Japanese advisor, would begin to fear for his sister's safety when she still remained on the nearby island of Saipan. Determined to bring his sister back to Anatahan, as the Americans closed in. He would soon depart Anatahan to leave his wife Kazuko, although he was expected to return within a few days. But that was not the case. Soichi Higa would never return back to the island. Eventually over time, without any response or appearance, he was assumed as dead, leaving his wife Kazuko on the island alone with his senior advisor, Masachi Higa, and the island's laborers. Kazuko would not dwell long on the presumed loss of her husband, as under the surface for quite some time, Kazuko and Kikuchiro had both developed feelings for each other, given their close proximity and isolation. With Sohochi's assumed death, the two remaining Japanese on the island would begin seeking ever more comfort in each other, becoming closer and a new couple. But their newfound life on the island, with just the two of them and their native laborers, would soon again be interrupted by war, and where the true legend of the island of Anatahan would begin. Later that year, in June of 1944, a three-day-long battle would rage amongst the turbulent waves and in the skies of the Mariana Islands that would see the crumbling Japanese Air Force and Navy decimated in a battle that would become to be known as the Great Mariana Turkey Shoot. It's during this battle that three civilian cargo ships hired by the Japanese Navy to be used as troop transporters was sunk by the US, not far from the island of Anatahan. 
of the 31 remaining survivors from the three sunken ships would all swim ashore and scramble onto the nearby safety of the rocky shores of the island. Little did they know, they were not the only Japanese already there. A couple days later, while the shipwrecked survivors scavenged the land for food, they would come across a startling discovery, not of the imagination. That being a fellow Japanese couple, a woman and a man picking fruit as well. The two groups would greet each other, utterly shocked to what their eyes could see. They would soon rejoice at the first sighting of their fellow countrymen in this far-flung place in the world, especially for the survivors of the shipwrecks, since nearly being killed a few days prior. There seemed to be some hope for the 31 survivors after all. They would all come to live as past life, eating coconuts, taro, wild sugarcane, fish and lizards. They smoke crushed dried papaya leaves, wrapped in the leaves of bananas, and made an intoxicating beverage known as tuba or coconut wine. The Japanese on Anatahan would first come to live separately with Kazuko and Kikachiro residing independently on the opposite side of the island. The two groups decided eventually that the chances of survival were better off together as one collective group, foraging for food, fishing and sharing all materials. But inevitably over time, with the extremely unbalanced male to female ratio and with the combination of raging testosterone and the fantasies these lonely men must have had led to the tension in the camp rising over time. When the Japanese survivors found out that the couple of Kikichiro and Kazuko were indeed not actually officially married, the men's fantasies sparked and rose ever more. A pressured Kikichiro and Kazuko decided to squash the growing fantasies by performing a mock wedding that would cement their relationship and their love as a couple. After this wedding, Kikachiro and Kazuko had decided that it would be best for them to separate from living amongst the rest of the other Japanese men once more, as they departed to live again on the opposite side of the island. And as a result, for a while, peace on Anatahan resumed once more amongst the chaos of war engulfing the majority of the Pacific Islands nearby. But peace on this island always didn't seem to last too long. War would once again find its way back to the island, now with devastating consequences for the remaining of its Japanese inhabitants. On the 3rd of January 1945, 97 B-29 Super Fortress bombers would take off from Isley Airfield on Saipan for a bombing raid on the port facilities on the coastal Japanese city of Nagoya near Tokyo. With only 79 bombers of the original 97 eventually reaching their destination, dropping their bombs on the port target and then headed back to Isley Airfield. While flying back home to Saipan, one of the remaining B-29 bombers on its first ever bombing run would suffer mechanical issues from damage received from anti-aircraft fire, with the Super Fortress losing altitude near Anatahan. As the plane descended uncontrollably, it would eventually crash land high on the side of the volcano on the island, some two and a half thousand feet above sea level, with the entire crew being instantly killed on impact. The humongous crash wouldn't go unnoticed, as the Japanese on the island had heard the huge commotion caused by the aircraft's impact and destruction. But in actual fact, they had no certain idea of what it actually was that crashed, or where it even could be found. With the Super Fortress being declared missing in action, as it was last seen descending towards Anatahan. A search party was soon organized by the Americans to locate and recover the bodies of the deceased airmen. 
For this search party, the Americans would summon the local Chamorro people from the other nearby Mariana Islands, all allied with the Americans, to head down to Anatahan and locate the bodies. The Chamorros would soon land upon the island and in the coming days conducted their search. Not long on the island would the Chamorros catch a startling glimpse of the local unknown Japanese inhabitants. Spotting the Japanese enclave while ascending up the volcano. The stunned Japanese too spotted the Chamorros alongside their local inhabitants and not knowing of the Chamorros intentions the Japanese would immediately flee and hide away and disperse within the jungle. But the Japanese were already spotted by a curious search party just surprised to see just so many of them on the island for the days of the island's plantation had long ended. The Chamorros located and recovered the bodies of the deceased airmen and upon returning back from the island they would inform the American military of their shocking discovery. The Americans in response would send a search party that would land on the island to scout and investigate these concerning reports. A few months later, in May of 1945, an element of the 24th Infantry Regiment would land on Anatahan, where they would stay for a week on the island. With no reported sightings of the Japanese, as they once more hid desperately into the jungle, trying to avoid capture. On August 15, 1945, Japanese Emperor Hirohito announced the formal surrender of Imperial Japan, bringing a final end to World War II. But for many of his Imperial soldiers, out of contact with the Japanese mainland, and left in the small remaining isolated pockets across the Pacific, it was business and war as usual. Trying to survive in still assumed wartime, and for those on Anatahan, it was no different. The Americans, however, determined to flush out these remaining pockets of Japanese resistance, would once more return to Anatahan, in boats with sirens blasting the word that the war had ended, hailing the Emperor's message and dropping leaflets on the island from planes above. For the Japanese survivors, they were simply not buying the story of a mainland Japanese surrender. As for them, just how could the mainland give up and quit so easily, not knowing of the actual events that occurred? Convinced the Americans were trying to either psyop or hoax them into captivity and imprisonment. However, the local native laborers did not share the same ideas as the Japanese, as they would all surrender and give up to the Americans with no fuss, as their hellish nightmare on Anatahan finally came to an end. As the months rolled into 1946, the Japanese, still living in isolation in their separate groups, would eventually finally discover and come across a relic of the war previously unknown. When in early September of 1946, Kikuchiro and Kazuko stumbled upon the wreckage of the crashed B-29 bomber, immediately all the Japanese would regroup once more and strip down the carcass of the aircraft for any useful materials or equipment used to create some actual ingenious designs. The parachute lines were rewoven into fishing lines and also used to create new clothing. Any aluminum from the B-29 was also converted into cooking utensils, razors, harpoons and knives. Oxygen tanks were used as makeshift water catchments. Any engine bolts were reused for cutting and drilling. Bits of plexiglass were also modified into underwater goggles, with them too creating even instruments called samisons, similar to that of the banjo, for some modest entertainment. However, the Crash B-29 would also provide the Japanese survivors with a pair of instruments of death in the form of 245 caliber revolvers alongside a box of 70 rounds of ammunition. 
that would bring a new destructive way of life to the island, as the fabrics of any remaining civilized society quickly fell to the wayside. Pretty soon, whoever had the guns had complete power and could control the others to do as they pleased, to get whatever they wanted, when they wanted, and what the Japanese survivors wanted more than anything else that is, a piece of Kazuko. These two revolvers would first fall in the hands of the two original Japanese sailors who discovered them in the B-29. And they would come to use these pistols as a power wand, eventually getting as they desired in Kazuko. Threatened by violence, Kazuko would welcome up to the original pistol wielding duo into her relationship with Kikachiro as Kikachiro was helpless to stop this relationship from forming into a new foursome, where they would all share the company of Kazuko. As you can probably have guessed, this new relationship with the two added men would not be ideal, and over time jealousy and tension rose once more, not only amongst the remainder of the unarmed Japanese survivors, but also within Kazuko's new trio of men. Suspiciously, the following year in 1947, Kikachiro would mysteriously die from an apparent food poisoning episode. But his death would not be the last, as the men continued to feud over the pistols and the right to Kazuko's company, as she would emerge as the new leader of the island following Kikachiro's death and the apparent queen of Anatahan. After Kikachiro's death, our original Japanese pistol-wielding duo would continue their relationship with Kazuko. But, as always, jealousy and greed would cause infighting between the two Japanese men, leading to the death of the other, as now Kazuko only had one man in her life once more. But his life would too be cut short, just three months later, when he was too killed by the other Japanese men, igniting a chain of events whereby whoever had ownership of these pistols would be assassinated by the other Japanese men. As more and more men were picked off by the group one by one, as anyone who even appeared to show any affection or interest in Kazuko would be cause for further feuds amongst the men, as they would continue to keep dying in mysterious and suspicious scenarios, such as being swallowed by the waves while fishing. As 1947 came to a close, with the rising death toll on the island completely unknown to the Americans, who were still continuing their campaign of trying to convince the Japanese to surrender, dropping leaflets and now Japanese magazines, describing how the war had ended. The most senior officer amongst the remaining survivors, Captain Ishida, had hoped to once and for all bring peace back to the island by getting Kazuko to finally decide and choose only one partner and having them marry again in front of the rest of the men, as this was hoped to in some way, hopefully end the violence. Funny enough, the partner Kazuko would choose would later on be killed in what appeared to be a never-ending cycle of death bestowed upon Anatahan. So eventually the remaining survivors left had to come up with yet another plan in an attempt to keep the peace after this marriage failure. The new plan? To throw the two revolvers finally into the ocean, throwing away their destructive force that the guns had unleashed on the island. This new plan, thought to be the final solution, will actually turn out yet again not to be the final answer as over the coming weeks and months, even though the revolvers were now at the bottom of the ocean, a further four more deaths or disappearances would occur on Anatahan, puzzling the remaining survivors as to why these deaths were still occurring. By June of 1950, of the original 31 Japanese men shipwrecked on the island, now only 19 remained, and in the plight of the remaining survivors, a now seemingly final solution was created, as the men had voted in order to bring lasting peace, the only solution was to assassinate and get rid of Kazuko. 
to end the desire for her that had swept through the island for the last half a decade. The men all voted and agreed. Kazuko's days as the Queen of Anatahan appeared to be numbered. Until just before the plan was about to go underway, one of the Japanese men had a change of heart and would inform Kazuko of the plot to kill her in the coming days. Grateful to the Japanese man who would inform her and save her life, Kazuko knew she needed a quick escape off the island in order to survive. Her opportunity for escape would come soon enough, as she was handed a lifeline from her certain death sentence in June of 1950, when one day she would spot a US patrol boat on the horizon not too far from the island. Leaving in a USPT boat, she would be collected and be the first of the remaining Japanese to leave Anatahan and be the first to be on her way back home. With Kazuko's homecoming party first making a quick stop over in Saipan, Kazuko's surrender would come as a surprise to her American captors. Puzzled as to where the rest of the remaining reported men on the island were at still, once in Saipan, Kazuko would reveal all for the American authorities. She would confirm the actual number of Japanese men left on the island and inform the Americans of their continued denial in the war's actual end. Kazuko once again set sail to mainland Japan. Once in Japan, Kazuko's story of her ordeal quickly captivated the nation's news outlets and the press would forge Kazuko into a minor celebrity overnight, as all now knew or refer to Kazuko as the Queen of Anatahan. In Japan and around the world, her new hero persona quickly grew, deciding she would need to capitalize on the incident, as Kazuko would go on to play and act in theaters as literally herself detailing the ordeal on Anatahan. In Kazuko's early version of her accounts on the island, she claimed to the Japanese press that only two of the men on the island actually killed themselves fighting over their love for Kazuko and that the other 10 men and their deaths were as a result over either infighting, disease or starvation. More importantly, the families of those who Kazuka mentioned still to be alive and on the island would rejoice in the fact and the news that their loved ones were not dead and sunk to the bottom of the ocean as previously thought. As the story gained ever more momentum, the Japanese government were now shifted into the spotlight. As such, they devised a new plan to help get the remaining men off the island. This plan? To personalize the leaflets and the packages dropped on the island. Some items were collected alongside a white flag with instructions for the men to follow in their process of surrendering. A total of over 200 letters were dropped on the island on the 26th of June 1951, with them soon being collected by the men down below. The men would immediately recognize these handwritten letters from their wives and children and after all these years, they now finally believe the end was true. Several days later on the rocky laid shores of Anatahan, rose a white flag waving in the Pacific sky. The men were ready to go home. The American sailors observing on the coastline quickly hurried and radioed back to what they saw. Soon the tugboat known as the USS Kokopa would come and collect the Japanese. As soon as the tugboat had arrived, its commander on board and his interpreter departed by speedboat to personally welcome and collect the Japanese. As Lieutenant Commander James B. Johnson and his interpreter Ken Akantani approached the shore, in an act of mutual respect to their captors, the Japanese survivors would line up in formation, holding each other's hands raised in the air awaiting for their captor's arrival. Lieutenant Commander James B. Johnson arrived ashore and would soon inspect the Japanese men and as a sign of respect would shake each of their hands as two former enemies would come to embrace. 
Thereafter, the Japanese would climb aboard the small boat, and an ecstatic energy would sweep through the survivors, as the realization that their war had finally come to an end. As they departed the shores, they had a final goodbye and a close view of the island. All the survivors would stand up, cheering and shouting, as they said goodbye to the island they called home since 1944. Back on board the USS Coco Pa, the ship would set sail for a quick stop over in Guam before departing for mainland Japan. A week later, once finally in Japan, the 18 survivors arrived home to a hero's welcome by their families and loved ones. The remaining surviving men first tactically chose to avoid the media and their entire fiasco surrounding their return. When questioned on Anantahan, the Japanese men all gave conflicting statements, contradicting that of their fellow survivors. The truth wouldn't take long to come out, as the men would reveal the true horrors of Anatahan, stating that the true reason for all the killings was over Kazuko in and of itself, and by the end of 1951, Kazuko was done touring the country and profiting off the ordeal, as quickly public opinion on her dramatically shifted overnight as the Japanese media would align themselves with the tales told by the surviving men, casting Kazuko in a new evil light. Still, the story would continue to spread like wildfire around the world, and was featured in Life magazine, where an article on Anatahan quickly caught the eye and captivated director and filmmaker Joseph von Sternberg, who in 1953 retold the tale and released the film Anatahan, welcomed with a lukewarm reception in theatres, as some of the acting in the film was heavily criticised for their poor performances, as well as the film portraying a more sympathetic view and attitude towards Kazuko, which some took the wrong way. Interestingly enough, although the film was not a major box office hit, the film was claimed to be as the favorite film of legendary singer Jim Morrison, who was actually a film student at the University of California in Los Angeles, where Joseph von Sternberg himself had been serving as a professor. From being a victory item to a new supposed scapegoat, with the end of a few short years of fame, Kazuko would return to living a normal life once more for the remainder of her years. Kazuko would eventually remarry and live a happy life with a new husband for about nine years until he passed away and she would be widowed and come to spend the rest of her days alone. Throughout this entire time Kazuko would still try and recaptivate her life story opening a ice shaved shop named Anatahan with her new husband before his passing. For Kazuko she would come to live an obscure life back on her native Okinawa till her eventual passing at the age of 50 from a brain tumour in March of 1974. Five years before Kazuko's passing in 1969, the remaining men from Anatahan would finally put pen to paper and truly reveal their tale of the island in a book named The Lost Men of Anatahan, giving a small resurgence to the story and further knocking down the already low reputation of Kazuko. The ultimate underlying story of Anatahan is that how human desire engulfed a group of isolated survivors. With the breakdown of societal rules, our primeval instincts always take over. Today the volcanic island has returned to life, as the volcano is no longer dormant, following a series of earthquakes that led to subsequent eruptions in 2003 and 2008, as all the remaining inhabitants on the island were evacuated, and it remains that way ever since, as no one has lived on the island since 2008, and Anatahan remains uninhabited ever since. <laughs>